for the small guy, I'm not the bigger butt. Well, I shouldn't say the bass is so just so that you're all, your eye pass to bring your eye to bring your high junior high pastor here. So it's really nice to see you, some new faces. I was actually pretty impressed. Um, why don't you stand with us today um, as we get into worship? I'm just going to pray us into that today. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for all that you've been doing and all that you're going uh, to do. Uh, Lord, we thank you for today that you've made this day, uh, that you order our steps, that you are a lamp upon our feet, Lord. Today, I pray as we go into worship that uh, would we just put you as the main thing tonight, uh, today. Would you just be the forefront of all that we do as we sing and as we worship you, God? Uh, would you just be what we look to in our times of need, in our times of worry, when we are anxious, Lord? And we just pray in your name, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Only put our hands together this morning. Chain will break, it's broken hearts to clear. 
Lord, today, God, as we come into your presence, Jesus, we worship you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. God, we say thank you for your goodness and your kindness, that, God, you never leave us, never forsake us. So, God, remind us this morning of who we are to you, Lord. Jesus, if we've come in from a hard week, hard circumstance, God, let us find you rest. But, God, if we're coming from victory this week, God, we celebrate with you today because you are a God who is good in every season, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus.
there's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Into presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. The seed is now left When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone In your presence, Lord Let's sing this together, Holy Spirit
for Nico as we continue to pray for him uh, for full remission of the cancer God we just pray in this time that your miraculous healing hand would be over him we also pray for Eric's uh, surgery recovery would he be able to recover quickly we pray that this would be a fast transition of recovery for him as he is uh, just recovering from a surgery and we also pray for pray for a dislocated disc in one of our congregation members back, God, that you would just be healing that in your name, God. We give these things to you, knowing that you are the only healer, the great physician, and we come to you with these things, God. As a church body, we, we believe of your healing works, God, and we pray for all the unspoken needs today, whether it be anxiety, depression, maybe a tough week. Lord, we give it all to you at the foot of the cross knowing that with you all things are possible. God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today, just before you're seated, I did want to take one more chance to pray today because if you've been watching the news, uh, there's lots happening around the world. And, you know, yesterday I had a chance to go to a beautiful funeral. It was wonderful. 
and it got my mind on heaven and what I have now and here, but what I'm looking forward to. And then I got home and I turned on the news and I watched the state of the world that we live in. And, you know, scripture reminds us when we see the signs of the times, when we see the world around us, when we see chaos, we see evil, we see brokenness, we see destruction, we see greed, we see war, we see death. We should be reminded that we serve a good God who's conquered all these things. You know, we believe in the imminent return of Jesus. And often we're asked, how do I pray in hard situations? I pray that Jesus come quickly. You know, for every complicated mess around the world, and how do we sort this out? And its history goes back so far. You know who could fix it in a moment? is Jesus. And so I, I was reading this morning as I came, and I, uh, this is the picture we have of life with Jesus. In Revelation 21, it says, I hear a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and he will be, and they will be his people. God himself will be with him and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for I tell you, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. He also said, it is finished. Because I'm the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. To all those who are thirsty, I freely give springs of the water of life. All those who are victorious will inherit all the blessing, and I will be my I will be their God, and they will be my children. You know, we don't walk through life without hope. Don't give in to discouragement. Don't give in to worry. Don't give in to panic. Don't give in to the ticket on the news line that you watch every single week. We serve a good God. He's a God with a plan. He's a God with a hope and a future for you. And so let's just pray today that we see his kingdom come. Amen. God, we praise you today. God, we come in worship. We come in adoration. But God, we come in hope. We come in trust and we come in faith that, God, you are the God of all things. God, we pray for the Middle East today. God, we need you to come soon. God, we need you to come soon. We need your justice. We need your mercy. We need your kingdom to reign above all other things, above all egos, all powers and principalities. God, against the move of the enemy in our world, every broken thing, every sign of death, every sign of sickness, God, we we push them out and we invite your kingdom to come. So God, would you come quickly? God, would you bring your kingdom quickly? God, we're so thankful that you love us, that you save us, but God, would you come in your fullness soon? Would you move me to love my neighbor, to love the people in my life because you're coming soon? God, I believe you are coming soon. It should change the way that I live. And so God, when I see the world around me, God, I'm not gonna be scared. I'm gonna be reminded that my life has a purpose and that purpose is the kingdom of God. And so God, we pray your kingdom and you're awesome in your mighty name we pray. Amen, amen. You can be seated today. Why don't you say hi to somebody as you sit down, greet them. Just a few quick announcements for you today. Well, if you were with us last week, um, we had a bit of an impromptu fire drill. And so I just want to remind you quickly today, um, if in the event of a fire drill, I've been asked to remind us, even if it's fake, even if it's a kid pulling a fire alarm, we all have to leave the building. <laughs> I know it feels like, I hope you feel at home, uh, but the fire department has asked me to remind everybody, even if it's an alarm, we have to leave. And so where do we leave to? We leave to the front covering where the sign is. That's kind of our designated area. And so in the event of a real fire or a fire drill or a kid having the time of his life pulling that fire alarm, uh, please, would you exit the building with us and go to that front pergola patio area? Uh, and that just shows the fire department that we have a plan and that we know what we're doing and that they like us even more than they do. Um, we might have to call them back. Did you see the guy with the arms? You saw the guy? With, yeah, yeah, you did. Anyway, Pastor Lori said she might have to pull it one more time to get him to come back. There she is. That's awesome. 
Well, if it's your first time here, we're so glad you're with us today. Please, if you'd help us by filling out one of those Connect cards, it's just our simple way to get in touch with you again. We want to make you feel welcome and at home here at our church. And we promise we won't put you on a mailing list unless you uh, opt into it, but it's just a way for us to follow up with you and uh, connect with you again. I do want to make mention that our baptism day is going to be in June, likely the beginning of June. And so there's still some time to sign up to get baptized. We now have six people getting baptized, which is exciting. So let's just make it 26. Does that sound good? We'll dunk you twice. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we'd love to have you get baptized. So you can sign up online. Stovall.church slash signups is where everything you can find. I do want to make mention of our set or dinner happening on April 26th. It's at 5.30 p.m. hosted by Hilda. Hilda, want you wave. Hilda has an incredible team that was already here this week in preparation getting ready. Uh, you can sign up today for that at our connect table. You can sign up, just write your name there. Uh, it's going to be a great time together. Also, our 50 plus lunch is not happening this week, but next week, and it's going to be here on site. That team's, I checked my email this morning, and I just found a plethora of plans uh, about the spring lunch that they're having together next Wednesday. Again, you can sign up for that at the connect table. We'd love to have you there, and it's a great way to connect with someone in our church. Uh, well, the last bit of news would probably be a save the date. We mentioned it last week. We have a slide up there, I think, uh, for Pastor Victor and Abby. They are getting married in, a in August, not April. April's almost over. In August, and we want to bless them. And so on uh, May the 5th, following our service, we're going to have a bit of a stand-up cupcake uh, wedding shower. Uh, but we've made available their wedding registry. We want to bless them and show our love and care for them. You can go to stovall.church slash shower and find all the spoons that Victor has tagged for his new life together with his wife. Uh, but if you would join us in doing so, a few of you asked already where you could find it. Church website, stovall.church slash shower. You can find all the information there. What a Vogue picture of you, Victor. Like, look at that thing. Looks like an album cover. Anyway, it's fine. Well, our last act of worship today is our giving. You can do so with one of the envelopes here today. Uh, you'll find them on the podiums at the back there. Uh, you can give by cash or check today with the envelopes or, of course, and as always, you can give online. You can take one of these home with you. All the instructions for online giving are on the back, and we would thank you for your continued faithfulness in your tithes and in your offerings. So thank you. Well, we're going to dismiss our kids today. Kids are dismissed down this hall and junior high is down this hall. Otherwise, you are invited to stand today. I invite you to say hi to somebody you don't know. That's the plan. Someone you don't know today, go out of your way, shake their hand, say hello, grab a coffee, and we'll be back here in five minutes with the word.
Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Good morning, everybody. So good. Yeah, there we go, Brody, in the front row. Give me the energy I need. Well, you're invited to join us from the back there. Check one, two. Make sure I'm not too hot. Thank you very much. I'm not a little bit there. There we go. That sounds better. Well, we're so glad that you're with us today. I invite the guys uh, and the people in the back to come join us and grab a seat here today as we are kicking off a new kind of mini series. I have, we have two, I have two Sundays before my baby arrives, so I had enough time for two messages in a mini series after Easter. And so uh, we're going to spend the next two weeks talking about what does it mean to be a cheerful giver? What does it mean to be a cheerful giver? That the marker of a follower of Jesus as a, as a Christian is that we would choose to live a generous life. And so over the next two weeks, I want to focus on two key areas in the life of a believer where God not only wants to see us be generous, but joyful as we're generous, if you can believe that. First, that we would be people who give cheerfully and generosity towards building the kingdom of God. That we would invest ourselves and we would invest our life into what he is doing and what his kingdom is about. And secondly, that we would be people who give cheerfully and generously towards meeting the needs of the world around us. I want to remind you just before we jump in, we do have Share Day happening next Sunday. Next Sunday, we are hosting a free community closet. Nicole has been the mastermind of all of our Share Day stuff with a team that she has. Nicole and Holly, give it up for them. It is, they've done a boat, I can't even communicate the boatload of sorting and work that they have done to sort all of your clothes and many other clothes, but uh, if you are willing and able to get involved, we need uh, tables, if you have tables, if you have folding tables, we do need those, and of course, the donations are still open there, but you can talk to Nicole after the service, that'd be awesome. She said no, but she meant yes, she really wants to hear from you. They're closed today? See, just like that, it's over, and you missed out. Can you believe it? Well, we want to talk a little bit about developing a cheerful heart and cheerful giving and how we choose to be generous. You know, we said last week, and we've talked about often, how matters to God. Not just that we are generous, but how we are generous, it matters to God. Paul in 2 Corinthians, he lays it out for us this way. He says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds gets a small crop, But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. And now underline, highlight this. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly and don't give in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need with plenty left over to share with others. Finding the joy in giving, in generosity, it's an important thing for us to wrestle with. How we give matters to God, and that we give matters to God. And yet, we are not people who give out of pressure. We're not people who give out of persuasion. No, no, no. The hope of Jesus is that as we practice and learn to grow into generosity, we find joy as something that is genuine, something that is a testament and a testimony to the love of God that is in my heart and the love to bless with what is in my hands. As is true in many things in the kingdom of God, Jesus first speaks to the heart, then he directs the hands. He speaks to the heart, then he directs the hands. We find when he is always confronting the Pharisees, they get it backwards. They want to manage your hands, and they could care less about your heart. And Jesus comes to clarify, uh, this is a heart issue first, a hands issue second. I think the Lord would challenge us to consider today not just generosity, but the joy of generosity and cheerful giving. A few years back, I, we got our whole town together when I was in Hamilton, uh, in, in Waterdown, for a youth rally. And we got all the youth groups together, and we were trying to host them all for just a big party youth rally at the end of the school year. And uh, so there was about 250, 300 teenagers packed in our little country church, and it was sweaty and gross and a ton of fun and chaos. 
And we were doing this big giveaway that whoever brought the most friends got like a huge jar of just, we crammed it full with as much candy as humanly possible, like sour keys and all the good stuff. Big feet are my favorite, just packed them down inside. And so this one kid who's in junior high, he is earnest, he's excited, he was like, I want that candy. Like, if I get candy from church, my mom will let me keep it. Praise the Lord. And so he asks all of his friends. He brings 25 kids with him to the rally. And he, go, he numbered them all. You all need to come here and stand up, and you can see. I brought all 25 of these students, and so I get that candy. And so we brought them to the front and said, he brought 25 kids. Woo! And we give him this big, huge jar, and it was just like the best day of his life. I loved it. Look on his face. So the service is over and our after party starting and there's pizza and there's games outside and there's a Gaga ball pit and a bonfire and, and he is probably the most popular kid in the whole room now. He's the kid with like the goods. And kids are like, oh, come on, man, you have, can you just share a little bit with me? And he's like, oh, I'd love to, no worries. He opens it up, oh, peasants, just like <laughs> they scatter down below him. He's just, he's eating it up. He's loving it. Most popular guy there, the guy with the big jar of candy. Until eventually he's giving it away, giving it away. The guys want to be him. The ladies want to be with him. He's giving it away. And he runs out of candy. He's like, oh, it's all gone. I gave it all away. I wouldn't have given it all away if there wasn't going to be any left for me. <laughs> I was like, that's amazing. It's like, did you give it away to everybody? He goes, yeah, I gave it away to everybody. I said, okay, I'll top you up just a little bit. But you know, I, I miss working with junior highs because uh, they're very honest. I wouldn't have given it away if I knew that there wasn't going to be enough for me. I wouldn't have distributed it. I wouldn't have been so generous. I wouldn't have been so careless with my generosity, even though I got carried around and was excited. I wouldn't have done it if there was not enough for me. And you know, as we come to talk about being generous and being a cheerful giver, you know, I like that story because it reminds me of often of the core desire that each of us have to ask, will there be enough for me? Will there be enough for me? It's a very normal, it's a very warranted concern. You know, when we talk about our finances, we talk about debt, we talk about resource, we talk about generosity. I think we need to be upfront in speaking to and recognizing that the most common emotion towards our money is, who wants to guess? It's the most common emotion towards our money. Worry. It's worry. It's a lot of worry. The weight of, do I have enough? Will I have enough? And what do I need to do to have enough? And that's not always a question of vanity. Sometimes it's just a question of good stewardship. The old saying goes, you always want to have more money than month. And yet there's no panic like a paycheck panic when you got more month than money, so to speak. You know, I want to be sensitive today because I know many of us come from a different reality when it comes to our resource and finances. And there can be few things in our life that feel more personal, more private, and more sensitive, more vulnerable than our money especially in today's day and age and in this economy. You know, as of 2024, recent stats would say that 40% of all Canadians today would not just indicate a baseline worry about their financial future, but a strong and considered panic about their financial future. 40%. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's not me. I'm just kidding. Just... Half the room. <laughs> Everybody went, Amen. Half the room here today, you're not just worried, you're overcome by it. It's the talk of the town. Worry. And I am not one for financial ignorance, but like we said last week, I often find that a diet of anxious toil just leaves me feeling more hungry. It's only natural. You know, our finances for us, they create opportunity. They can create security, they can create status, they can create image, they bring options, and when we feel like we have enough, it can create breathing room that we can just rest for a moment. And yet for all the anxiety, for all the worry, for all the weight of our dollars in sense, Jesus' claim over you as a disciple is that you do not need to worry. You do not need to worry. And more than just not worry, he says that I actually have the ability to trust. 
And more than trust him, I have the ability to be generous in partnership with him. And more than be generous, I have the ability to be joyful while I do it. That might be seemingly like a leap too far from worry to joy in generosity. Jesus in this economy, like no offense, Jesus, you just, you just may not understand. You were a nomadic couch surfing rabbi who backpacked across Israel with your fishing buddies. What do you know about my situation today? It's not how the real world works. I got a mortgage payment, Jesus. I got a car payment. I got a kid in one of your private schools. And I know it's plentiful where you came from, but around here, gas is $1.60 a liter. Jesus, I don't always feel like you understand when I read the scripture. And yet, the caution for us from Jesus is to believe the lie of my youth rally friend that giving can only be joyful out of abundance. Giving can only be something that we love to do out of the overflow of our life. Jesus proposes for us that the joy in giving is much more than the posture of our heart than the prosperity of your portfolio. And so today, we're going to talk about finances, but more importantly, we're going to talk about our hearts. And while I know today this might be a deeply personal topic, I can tell by how quiet the room already is. (laughs) Let's just talk about my finances today. Let's talk about the journey of my heart, not your heart. You're off the table today. Uh, Talk about how the Lord has blessed my life and what he's done in me. Because the Lord has blessed me deeply. But I can tell you and I can testify that it's not because of deep pockets but it's because of a deep desire to walk in obedience and the provision of God for my life. So if you have your Bible here today, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to get there together. And this portion of scripture is a teaching given by Jesus in his famous Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is speaking to the hillside. And in this passage, Jesus, I think, is speaking right to the heart of the issue of our relationship with our finances, with our money. You know, it's not a modern problem. I think it can feel like a modern problem, uh, but it's a human problem. And this nomadic rabbi who backpacked across Israel with his fishing buddies, you know, he's compassionate to remind us of the orders of our loves in the kingdom as his disciples. Matthew chapter 6, we'll read it together. He says this, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store up treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. And underline, highlight, get it tattooed on your leg. This is, the, this is the passage. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, oh, how deep that darkness is. What is Jesus saying? Your perspective in life needs to be clear, honest, and true. And woe to us who think we see clearly and yet we are blinded by darkness. And so Jesus speaks plainly for us in this passage. He says, no one can serve two masters. You will love one and you will hate the other. You will be devoted to one and you will despise the other. You cannot serve God and be, underline this, enslaved to your money. That's why I tell you, do not worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worry add a single moment to your life, he says. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. Don't they, they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown out into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do we have so little faith, he asks. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? 
These things dominate the minds and the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need, it says. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Jesus is speaking plainly. He's speaking clearly. It's because he desires our perspective to be clear, our perspective to be plain. Because like everything that Jesus has for us, he is leading us into a life that is free from the weight and the burden of here and now because he's preparing us and inviting us to adopt a scope for our life that is eternal. It's eternal. And I think Jesus is calling us out of worry. And while the world around us continues to worry, followers of Jesus are invited to come out from under worry and lean into hope. Then again, like in every area of our life, we, when we choose to partner and trust Jesus for our future, uh, we can come out from worry and we can step into the fullness of what he has. And so simply today, as we look at how to not just be a worrier, but someone who trusts God, someone who doesn't just trust God, but someone who chooses to be generous, and not just someone who chooses to be generous, but someone who chooses to be joyful in our generosity, we're going to look at two things today. First of all, if we want to go from worry to joy in how we choose to give and bless, step one is we practice with our tithe. You know, every discipline, every area of my life, an area of my heart, it requires practice. Practice is the thing that gets me through. You know, my heart, I'll be the first to admit, my heart is a fickle thing. It's prone to wander. It's prone to want its own way. And yet God invites me to step into the routine, the rhythm, and the practice of my life because I need direction. I need guidance. The picture that Jesus often uses, sheep that have gone astray. If you spend any time with sheep, no offense to sheep, but they're not the brightest bulbs on the Christmas tree. (laughs) They tend to just kind of off to the left or off to the right. And Jesus says, you know, that's what our hearts can be like when we don't have direction, when we don't have guardrails, when we don't have routine and practices. And one of the ways that I train my heart in the things of God, and one of the ways that God invites me and commands that I live this way is he commands me to live and practice my faith with a tithe. It's a biblical principle of a tenth. And we first see it in Leviticus 27. He says, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord, And it must be set apart for him as what? Holy. We take it and we set it apart as holy. He says one-tenth of our earning is to be set apart for the Lord. It's an instruction to begin us in the practice of generosity. Tithe means tenth. Everybody say tenth. Tithe means tenth. Tithe means tenth. And I know when we come to faith in Christian circles, there can be some Christianese. It can be hard to swallow all those pills and know exactly what they all mean. But we have tithes, which means, come on, tithes, which means, and then we have offerings that are above and beyond tithe. And then beyond that, we have what is traditionally called alms, which is giving to the poor or to the widows. Tithe is our tenth. Proverbs 3.9 says it this way, Honor the Lord with your wealth and trust him with your first fruits above, uh, with all your crops. It's critical to understand that scripture is clear to us about the role of our generosity in our tithe. It just is. It is. And there's a very interesting study we can go to about the tenth, the first tenth, the first, first, first born, <laughs> there we go, and the first fruits all throughout the Old Testament. But you know, Jesus speaks the tithe as well. Uh, But as in many things that Jesus speaks about, he often applies a second measure in true Jesus fashion. And he's speaking to the Pharisees, and this is what Jesus says. He goes, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. We're off to a good start, Jesus. For you are careful to tithe even tithe the income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the most important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, 
But do not neglect the more important things, Jesus says. You know, Jesus is mindful here that he upholds the principle and the practice of tithing, but he places it in its rightful category, puts it in its rightful category. It's a command that, yes, we should do it, but Jesus very quickly clarifies for the Pharisees, our tithe, our generosity, and our giving is not our absolution. It's not my salvation. It's not the thing that set me free. It's not the thing that's going to give me a clean slate. Only Jesus does that, and he paid that all. So let's not get it backwards. Jesus paid it all for me to have eternity. That is not what our giving is about. That's not what our generosity is about. The practice of my tithe is about the tuning and the transforming of my heart. Jesus is very consistent in keeping the condition of our hearts before us, always. The number one thing Jesus speaks to is not what you should do, but what the posture of your heart should, do, should be in what we are doing. We practice with our tithe, but it's because we renovate. We're renovating our hearts. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them, where thieves break in and they can steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there will be the desires of your heart. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one, you'll love the other, you'll be devoted to one, you'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to your money. Jesus has no issue with wealth, not a problem. Jesus has no problem with wealth. He has no issue with your money. He's not trying to take it from you. He's not trying to store it away for himself. But Jesus is trying to make clear to me, Scott, you cannot serve two masters. If you want Jesus to come into your life and to bring freedom from your brokenness, from your sin, from your shame, from all the things he set me free from, Scott, why would you turn around and with that freedom, you would enslave yourself back to your money? Scott, why would you do that? God, you've just broken every chain and bondage in my life. You've set me on a course for eternity, but just let me handcuff myself back to the worry and the weight of my finances once again. Jesus' encouragement is, you know, you can't serve the master of Jesus and the master of money there comes a moment where we have to choose one. If you're a human being and you've been on a spiritual journey with Jesus in any capacity, you will also, though, begin to recognize that who I want to be and the reality of what sometimes I'm capable of don't always come into perfect alignment. There's many things that I desire to be in the Lord, and yet there's many moments where in my flesh and in my sin I come up against a roadblock where I desire to be more than I am. It's true in how I love people. It's true in my humility. It's true in my sense of forgiveness. And I'd be ignorant to think that it's not true in my finances as well. I have to tune my heart. I have to teach my heart to love the things of the kingdom of God in every area of my life. But how do I teach my heart? How do I tune my heart? How can I direct my heart? Scripture tells me that my heart is deceitful at moments above all other things. Even the world around us, we live by sayings like, well, the heart wants what the heart wants, as if there's no way to control it, there's no way to direct it, there's no way to bring it into alignment with what we want. The heart wants what the heart wants. And yet Jesus tells me in verse 21, Scott, wherever your treasure is, you're going to find the desires of your heart go there. You know, I, I might struggle from time to time to direct my heart, but Scripture tells me I can direct my treasure. And where I direct my treasure, my heart seems to be prone to follow. Absolutely true. You know, when I, I saved up, when I was a first youth pastor, I saved up all my money to buy this car. <laughs> and it was a Ford Fusion, so you knew it was a special, special car. I loved it. It was my favorite car. It's still the best, my favorite car I've ever owned. And I had spent every nickel I had into buying this car. Like it was just, I had put, up, put it all, I didn't want to have any debt, so I bought the car and I had nothing left. And we're hanging out after youth one night and a kid with a skateboard's riding around. He 
takes his skateboard and he puts it grip taped down on the trunk of my car and he jumps up. <laughs> and then his buddies. <laughs> and I turned around and I just like, everything that was Jesus in me left my body at one moment. It was just like, you want to get home alive and I probably need to run the other direction if that's going to happen because everything within me was like, you just ruined my car. My heart was probably in it too much. But it's because all my treasure was in it. Where I direct my treasure, don't be surprised to find that your heart disproportionately follows where you've directed your treasure. My tithe becomes significant for two reasons. First, in my life, it's my step of obedience. God wants me to be a cheerful giver. And while generosity is more than a percentage, God gives me a starting point, and Jesus is clear to uphold the practice. When I act in obedience in any area of my life, God's faithful to supply obedience always, period. Whenever I choose to be obedient, God is always faithful to supply obedience, not just in your finances, in every area of your life. Secondly, it's an act of worship. It's an act of adoration. Lord, you are the thing and are the one that I want the most. I want my heart to be your heart. I want what you love to be what I love. And this is where the Pharisees, they miss it. It's often where they've missed it. It's the beauty of obedience that Jesus challenges them. He goes, you know what, you Pharisees, you do it. You might tithe, but your heart's just not in it. That's his commentary. He goes, you're missing the worship. You're missing the adoration. You're missing the love. You're just practicing a duty. There's no power in just doing the duty. Where is the love for the things of God? You know, Mother's Day is coming up. This is your official reminder, gentlemen. Mother's Day is on its way. Sooner than you think. I'm just throwing it out there. And, you know, I like to celebrate my wife. She's... By Mother's Day, she's not just going to be mother of one, mother of two. I'm going to keep bringing it up because I'm pretty excited. But Mother's Day is coming. Now, yeah, you can get excited for me. Come on, somebody. But, you know, there are, there are two ways I could, I could uh, approach Mother's Day this year. You know, I, I could go and I could buy her a card. And <clears throat> I could buy her chocolates or flowers and One of those nice cards with the googly eyes on it. So when you shake it, it's looking all over the place. And I could write her a little message inside that says, to my little boo thing, you the best, love Scott. And here you go. (laughs) Here you go. And uh, I did it. There you go. Enjoy that googly eye card. And, you know, I probably wouldn't be chastised by my mother-in-law for that. She'd probably go, he did it. Good. Good for you. Or I could still do all of those things and yet take a moment to be intentional about my love, intentional about my adoration. Michaela, I love you. You are the mother of the two most beautiful things in my life. You have given me a gift that I will never fully reciprocate. It is a joy to live my life with you. Michaela, you are kind. You are gracious, and you're kind of a baddie. Come on, somebody. (laughs) You know, it's not. (laughs) That's awesome. I know that what I'm giving you is not much, but what I give to you, I just want to show my love and devotion to you. Happy Mother's Day. So who would go with option one? Who's like, that's going to (laughs) work? Who thinks option two is probably a better option? Yeah. You know, this is the beauty of the fullness of of practices in our life. You know, it's a step of obedience, and there's a blessing in, in being obedient. There's no two ways about it. But when we miss out on coming to the Lord with worship, with adoration, with love in the things that we practice, the routines in our life. Jesus, I love you. You died on a cross for me. You found me in the darkest moment of my life. I was far from you. You sought me out. How great the love of God is. And so, Jesus, I'm going to set apart what you say is yours. 
And I'm going to love to do it because this isn't something I'm just doing because it's written in a book somewhere. It's a joy and a practice out of my love for you. And it's a small thing that I do that's an indicator of a heart that I carry for you. And Lord, there are going to be moments in my life where I say no to things that I want so I can be obedient. But God, would you train me and teach my heart to say no to what I sometimes want now, but to what I really want the most, and that's you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. And our love for Jesus will be at the center of every discipline in our life, not just our finances. Why would I come to the Lord in prayer? It's because I love to speak with him. Why do I come to him in studying his word? It's because I want every ounce of wisdom and insight that he has for me because I love him. Why would I choose to be generous with the Lord? Because I love him. I care for him. I adore him. And I cannot serve two masters. And Lord, I want to serve you. But more than serve you, I want to bless the things that matter to you. I want to participate in obedience. I want to participate in worship. And I want to participate in the work of your kingdom. Lord, if I were honest, there are moments where generosity is a, it's a labor of love. It's a sacrifice to make. But Lord, it's one I want to make for you and I want to make with you. I can't always direct my heart, but I can direct my treasure. And where my treasure is, my heart seems to follow. And so God, would my treasure be in things that are eternal first? Would I choose to trust you with things that are eternal first and watch my heart flock there as well? Secondly today, you know, we practice with our tithe, but we trust him with our lives. Jesus speaks right to the heart of our human condition, that speaks right to our heart of worry, and he challenges us to evaluate who and what do we trust in the most. He paints a picture of the worries of our hearts. He goes, no one can serve two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. Be devoted to one, despise the other. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than the birds? Can your worry add a single moment to your life, Scott? You worry about these things saying, what am I going to eat and what am I going to drink and what am I going to wear? But just to remind you, these are the kinds of thoughts that people have when they don't have hope and they don't know their heavenly father. Because when they know their heavenly father, they will know that he will supply everything that they need. He already knows what you need. So seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, live in right standing with God and he will give you everything you need. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Jesus is not splitting hairs. He's challenging me. He's saying, Scott, people who don't know me and they don't trust me, they don't have faith in who I am or who I am to them, these people are dominated by the thoughts of, do I have enough? What will I eat? What will we drink? What will I wear? They are dominated by worry. That worry demands something from them. That's not how I want my disciples to live, is what Jesus says. If you know me and you love me and you trust me, Scott, you don't have to live like that. Because what do you know about me? What has God done for you? Well, I know your grace, God. I know your goodness. I know the level of sacrifice you're willing to make for me. God, I know your compassion. I know your love and I know your providence. And I know that you already know all that I need and that as your disciple, I've come under your care. I've given you my life. I am your responsibility. You provide all that I need. And what's my role? My role is to seek the kingdom above all else, to live righteously and to lean on a God who says he'll supply everything I need. That's a promise. That's one I'm going to test him on. <laughs> I'll seek your kingdom. I'll live rightly. But I'm going to lean into the promise, God, that you will supply all that I need. I'll bring it up often, Lord. <laughs> Scott, listen to me. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to bring its own worries. And I know you. I know that today's troubles are enough for you today. You know, uh, I have to tell you a little bit of an embarrassing story today. I suffer from something called gift paralysis. It's sweeping across the nation. 
And gift paralysis is when you have overthought a gift to the point that you've put it off and you've put it off and you've put it off and now it's the night before, so you overdo it. That's, <laughs> it happens all the time. My kid, Michaela has been blessed by it. It's amazing. One year, it was Mother's Day, or it was Valentine's Day. She had a bad, bad week at work and it was Valentine's Day and I, was, I was, didn't know what to buy and so I bought her an iPad out of the blue. I was like, no, oh, here's an iPad. Happy Valentine's Day. And she's like, I got you a card. And I was like, well, happy Mo- Valentine's Did you love it? She loves it. Woo, safe. Next year, I got her a picture of an iPad just to reset the expectations. I drew it myself. Here you go. They kind of equal each other out, back to normal. But one Christmas before we were dating, I wanted to impress her. I, wa- I knew I was going to ask her to marry me. I was like... I wanted to impress her. And so it was Christmas time, and I was, what am I going to buy her? I don't know what to buy her. And uh, we had always wanted to go to a Coldplay concert at the Sky Dome. What's it called now? Rogers Center. It's called the Sky Dome. Get out of here. And so we, uh, I wanted to see this. It's 50,000, 55,000 people. Like, we had heard from friends of ours. It's quite the experience to go and see it. And so I wanted to buy these tickets, and I had been saving up all of my honorarium money. I used to have a chance the odd time to go and lead worship for like a youth retreat or at a church somewhere, and you sometimes get a little bit of honorarium with that. So I was saving all my nickels and my honorariums to buy Michaela a Christmas present. So I looked up the tickets, tried to find a deal. Of course, I was maybe later than I probably should have been, so I was paying the deal price, which was, and the tickets were going to be $250 each. And I was like, oh, gift paralysis strikes again. I was like, okay, you know what? I've got the money saved. I've been saving it for months. Michaela's worth it. I'm going to buy the tickets. I bought the tickets. And when my credit card bill came in, I was charged $1,000. Yeah, I turned white. I was like, what, whiter than I turned? Yeah, like... (laughs) I wasn't always. No, I'm just kidding. I turned white. Like, like I don't have the money. Like, I didn't have the, I, like, my margins were thin. Like, I was living on my own, paying a mortgage. Like, I didn't have the money. And I panicked, and I gave my wife, she was my, I gave Michaela tickets, and I was, I hope you enjoy them. Just, like, sweating. Oh, what am I going to do? The next month comes, and it's January, and, you know, I had the moment where I was like, am I going to cut a little out from other areas of my life? Am I going to tithe this month? Like, ugh, God, I trust you. And I, I did everything as I normally do. But I said, God, I, I really need your help. And I know that I was a fool in this. And it, was, it said it was in Canadian, but they charged me U.S. And there was hidden fees. And by the time I went back to return them, the website had magically disappeared <laughs> somehow. But I had the tickets. So anyway, I got a phone call from our district office, and I'd done some, gone and traveled with them doing some ministry work, and they were closing their books for the year. And they said, Scott, we have an accounting error that we have to reconcile with you. I was like, oh, they need money from me too? Like, what's the deal? And they said, we actually can't close our books for uh, this year until we give you $1,000. And I was like, I'll do that every year for you guys. If, that will, <laughs> if it will help you close your books, I'll do it every year. You can sign me up. And they said, we had some unaccounted honorarium money that you, we owe you, and we didn't get it to you. And like, none of this moves gracefully, but I had my prayer towel out. Like, that's like, white boy was dancing. It was awesome. It was amazing. You know why I like that story? Uh, because I was a fool. I dug that hole. I put myself there. It was my fault. It was my foolishness. And it was my immaturity and irresponsibleness that placed me there. And yet, for some reason, God provided. When I really, really, really didn't deserve it. And, you know, I've always done my best to trust the Lord with my finances, whether I have a lot or whether I have a little. And what I'm not suggesting today is that if you honor the Lord with your finances, you're just going to get mysterious $1,000 checks. (laughs) It's not my point. Uh, But the promise that I can keep, the promise that I can make, is that God's provision is patient with me. It's good to me, and it's humbling. 
Because as in many things in my life, when I've made a mess that I can't pull myself out of, God's faithful to rescue. He's always been good to me. And as you process the word of God today, you might understandably be finding yourself in the place to go, Scott, the simple truth is I can't afford to do that. I, I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to give. I can't afford generosity in my life. You don't understand what my life looks like. And you're right, I don't understand every situation. You might feel like you found yourself in a pit that is impossible to get out of. Impossible. I've been there before. That is a real weight. That is a real worry. But if you would receive this today, you know, from a young age, my dad spoke over me. He went, Scott, you're always going to feel like you can't honor God with your finances. You can't afford it. You'll always feel that. He goes, but do you understand the truth is that you can't afford to live outside of the provision in the hand of God? And that's not a pressure today. I mean 2 Corinthians. We don't give out a pressure. There's no pressure. But it is true. It is true. That the hand of God in my life, I can't outgive God's provision. You know, today, you've been gracious with me to speak to something quite personal quite sensitive, sometimes tender. And yet as we go today, I want to remind us of Paul's words to be our guiding passage in this true north as we talk today. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. One who plants a generous crop will get a generous, generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart. It's not for me to say. You need to decide in your heart with the Lord what you want to give. And do not give reluctantly. Hear me. Do not give reluctantly. Do not give in pressure. I am not applying pressure. I promise you. Because the Lord loves a person who gives cheerfully. And how we do things, it matters to God. It matters a lot to the Lord. It's what he spoke to the Pharisees. It's what he speaks to me. It's what he's speaking to you. How we choose to trust him matters. But if we will trust him, God will give generously and provide all you need. Then you will always have everything and plenty left over to share with others, is what scripture says. We are people who live with an incredible freedom, but that's not just a freedom from sin or from brokenness, but it's a freedom to trust the Lord. And I can appreciate that that's a big step in some of the areas of our life. But I think he's calling us out from under worry today. And that as the world around us is worrying, he is inviting us to lean on him, to test him, to trust him, and to come under his blessing and his provision. We become people who are not just free from worry, but we practice generosity. And not just generosity but cheerful giving. It's not just generosity. You can be excited about it. You can be excited about it. So how do we do that? We practice with the tithe. We at least work towards it. God, would you tune my heart? Would you direct my heart towards the things of God by me directing my treasure to the things of God and watch as my heart follows? First in obedience, but God, additionally in worship, that my heart is in it not a duty I do and another check I sign or a bill I pay. No, Lord, that's one that I, I choose to do with thanksgiving and gratitude. And I recognize who you are to me. But secondly today, God, it's a reminder to me that I trust you with everything else. To recognize that I do not need to be dominated by worry like someone who doesn't know who you are. God, I know you and you know me. And I know that you are aware of all of my needs, so instead I lean into you. I lean into your love. I seek first your kingdom. That's my role. I live in righteousness. Only I can do that. I trust you to bring all that I need, and God, you're the one who's going to supply. You know, let's pray today. I'm going to invite Carm just to come back and play, because you know, we want to take a minute to pray, because this is one of those areas that are tender. And, 
You know, giving and tithe is something for people who are followers of Jesus. You know, if you're new to faith or you have no faith life at all, this is not about you. It is about you. But the pressure and the decision and all those things, I think you should just enjoy yourself today and enjoy being here. But for those of us who love Jesus and we are working to trust him in every area of our life, there comes a moment where we have to address the fact that God invites us to trust him in our finances. And for some of us, that's going to be some of the, one of the biggest steps of faith we're going to make because it's personal, it's a worry, it's a weight. And yet, as in all the worries, the weights, and the pressures of my life, God says, would you trust me with it? You know, with everybody's eyes closed today and really, really, really no one looking around, you might be here today and you feel like you've gotten yourself into a place you can't get out of. That you don't know how you got there, but you're there. And you don't know how you're going to get out of it. And it's a weight to worry. Maybe you've fallen into a hard circumstance against every odd of you doing what you thought you should do, and yet now you find yourself feel trapped. Again, with nobody looking around, please. I just want to pray for you today. If you wouldn't mind just lifting up your hand, we want to, we want to ask the Lord to come and do something miraculous in your life. Yeah, amen. See that hand, amen. You can put them down. Amen, I see those hands. Amen. Amen. Yep. You know, this, this principle of tithing and generosity, it's not about our church. I feel like I need to say that. <laughs> this principle for my life has been true everywhere I've ever been, anything I've ever done. It's a me and the Lord thing. You know, if you're here today and you put your hand up, you say to God, Lord, I need you to come and do something miraculous. My encouragement to you would be trust the Lord, participate in trust in the Lord. He will come through. His hand and his provision will come on your life. He will intervene. He will come with wisdom. He'll come with people to help you, but he will come with abundance. He's a God that loves us. He's our rescuer in every circumstance. And what he doesn't want for you is the weight of worry the weight and the discouragement. But what he has for you is joy. Joy today. So Lord, you see these hands. God, even hands that aren't raised, you know what I need. God, you know the mess I've made. God, you know the circumstance you found me in. God, you know everything about me. And so God, I choose to be honest and open with you. Because God, I need you. I need you in my life. God, I need you in my heart. God, I need you in raising a family. God, I need you in loving my neighbor. God, I need you in all these things. But God, I need you in my finances. I need your provision. God, I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your goodness. And God, I I need you to come and do what only you can do. So God, for those who lifted their hand today, God, we pray the miraculous. That God, you would come and, and show us what a God of endless goodness, grace, and love is. God, you bless us. Now, God, there be a testimony, not just in our heart, but in our resource of a good God. And as in all things, it would inspire us to serve, to give, to be generous. And not just generous, but joyful in how we do it. Amen. Thank you again. If it's your first time here, this may be an odd Sunday to be here. <laughs> I, can, I can appreciate that. It's not something we talk about often, but it matters to the Lord what we do with our hands. Thank you for being here. We're so glad you could join us today. I want you to stand today as we go and uh, say hi to somebody as we go. We're going to have some music on. We're not kicking you out, but grab your kids, please. Grab a coffee, and we'll see you guys next Sunday at 10 o'clock.